Amen. Good to be in the Lord's house tonight. Amen. 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 I don't know when the last time maybe you and your spouse or whoever may have went to the movie theater. Uh, we don't go to the movies very often, but a lot of times, uh, well, every time before a movie, they, they now show about probably 10 or 15 minutes for the previews of movies that's going to come and, and to try to advertise for them. And a lot of times, Sherry and I will look at each other and we'll say, we're not coming to see that. You know, and they'll show another movie. And it was, no, we're not coming to see that either. Very few of we even like. And I felt like that this morning when, when Brother Reuben announced that I'd be preaching tonight, that Maybe a lot of people looked at each other and said, uh, well, we're not coming tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, if they're worshiping the pastor instead of the master, that's their problem. Amen. Amen. We're glad you came tonight. We're glad for this good group on a Sunday night. And uh, like Brother Ruben said, he's in Crowell uh, this week in revival. We need to pray for him. We pray that God needs him there. They have a great revival, a great time there. And uh, I'm just uh, been amazed. And how God has been working in our church, how He's been moving, yes. and it's, uh, it's just been a blessing to see that. And I've been in this church my whole life, just raised right here behind the church, used to walk the church as a boy, and uh, we've seen some good times over the years, we've been through some hard times, but Lord, the Lord's really been blessing lately, yes. and I'm so thankful for that, and it's so refreshing to see the Spirit of the Lord move through here, to see folks get saved, to see folks just get right with God, and that's, that's the, the, the key to it all, is that we just get right with Him, then the Lord can move and work and do what He wants to do. And I'm thankful for our pastor tonight, for his leadership, uh, call of meetings like last weekend, to foresee that and, and, and hope that it would be good, and, and it was, and it was even better than I think he even thought it would be. And I, I just had a blast with the Lord family, they were, they were such a blessing, and I just kind of got to know Brother Darren a little bit in just a couple of nights there, and he's just a blessing. I'm just sure they go all over the country. Uh, doing uh, this, uh, their thing, you know, and singing and praising the Lord and, and lifting people up and making them feel good. And, and so we, we appreciate them and just thankful to the Lord for what He's doing in our church and excited about that. I told Brother Rickman earlier in the week we were talking about that. Of course, we always give God the glory for that. We don't, uh, you know, He doesn't pat Himself on the back or anything like that. And, and that's good because it is God's glory. Uh, but it, it's good to see. And I told Him, I said, whatever. I don't want to be uh, the cold water committee. I don't want to put the fire out. Amen. I don't want to be the guy that comes in and, and does that. But uh, we're going to do our best. It seems like every time I preach, it's right after, you know, the last time I preached, it was right after Bill Britt. And then this time, it's right after Darren Moore and, uh, and Ruben Weaver. And so, uh, anyway, we're going to do our best tonight. Just say a little prayer for us. I've, uh, I had a sermon already. Uh, I've been knowing I was going to preach for a couple weeks. And then a couple nights ago, uh, the Lord changed that up. You've heard preachers say that before, and I kind of know what that feels like now. And I just didn't feel good about what I was going to preach. It, it, it was a good message, but it just wasn't the right time. And so he gave me a new sermon, and I may not know it quite as well, but uh, we're going to do our best tonight. Uh, many of you may have know the story of Ruth. Uh, I'll ask this question before we get started tonight. Uh, what was Boaz, or who was Boaz, uh, before he married Ruth? And we know that he was ruthless, right? Brother <laughs> <laughs> Harold, if you'll explain that today, she won't laugh. Ten minutes <laughs> no, it's a. Uh, Brady told me that joke. So, uh, <laughs> we're not even looking at Ruth tonight. We're going to be in the book of Judges. So, everybody, we're going to start in Judges chapter 6. Amen. Judges chapter 6. We're looking at Gideon tonight. A very familiar name. I have to admit to you, I've read the story many times, and I'm sure we have studied it in Sunday school over the years. But I never really have dug into the story and to the, uh, the parts of it there that, that I feel like God has revealed to me in, in the past few days. And so we'll be looking at that tonight in Judges chapter 6. But the title of my sermon is The Battle is the Lord's. The Battle is the Lord's. And so We'll begin in verse 1 in chapter 6. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years, and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. 
And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they camp, uh, came up against them. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come to Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude, for both they and their camels were without number. And they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And it came to pass, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from, the, from Egypt, and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. Verse 9, And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all that oppressed you, and drave them out from before you, and gave you their land. I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to stand and preach your word. We pray you put your hand on us and that you'll bless us, Lord, in this time. Lord, we love you and we thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So in this verse, or in this passage, we see in verse 1 that the Israelites have turned their back on God. It seemed like a continual theme throughout the Old Testament how the Israelites would serve God and then they would turn their back on God and it was just a roller coaster ride for them. And so here they are, in verse 1 it says they did evil in the sight of the Lord. And so God had punished them by allowing the Midianites to come and overthrow them and to, to uh, impoverish them. It, it, the Bible says that when their uh, crops begin to grow, that the, the Midianites would go out and, and, and tear their crops up and they didn't have any food. The animals didn't have food to eat. And so they were in this bondage, it says, for seven years that God allowed this. And in verse 7, it says that the Israelites cried out to the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but it doesn't take me that long to cry out to the Lord uh, when things start going wrong. And I know i got sin in my life. I'll cry out and I'll repent. I'll say, Lord, forgive me, and let's get this thing back going. But it, for whatever reason, it took seven years for the Israelites to cry out to God and ask for His help again. And that's what they did. And God says, I want to bless you. We have to remember tonight that the Israelites were God's chosen people. He did not like to punish them, and He does not like to punish us today. But there's times in our lives when He has to get our attention. He has to allow things to happen. And like Brother Reuben says, if He'll just remove His presence, the world will take care of that. And so that's what He did. He removed His presence. The Midianites took them over, and they were punishing them. They were ruling over them. They were taking their things from them. And so uh, what God's message to them was, if you'll repent, I'll bless you. I'll deliver you. And I believe we could say the same thing for our lives tonight, that if we'll repent, if we'll get right for God, or get right with God, that He'll bless us, and that He'll take care of us. And that even though we go through the storms of life, He'll be there for us, if we will, in fact, repent and remove that sin that's in our life. And so we see here that uh, God is going to call this man to help lead the Israelites in battle against the Midianites. And so there's three things tonight we want to look at that God loves in this story. And the first thing we want to look at that God loves in this story of Gideon is that God loves the unqualified. He loves the unqualified. If you look through his word, you see that he uses people all through the Bible, and even in today's world, that are, seem to be unqualified, that wouldn't be the choice that we would make sometimes. And so he chose, uh, chose Gideon here in, in chapter 6, uh, verse 14. It says, And the Lord looked upon him, that's Gideon, and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. In verse 16, And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. God told Gideon to lead Israel in this battle. His response was, hey, you got the wrong guy. God, look, my family is the poorest family in Manasseh. God, I'm the, I'm the least of my family. I can't do this. Well, I haven't heard that before. 
Remember Moses? He called Moses to lead Israel out of bondage in Egypt. And Moses said, God, I can't do that. I can't speak very well. I, I have a stuttering problem. I, I'm not very well at public speaking, and this is going to require that. And, and God said, I got to take you care of. Aaron will be your spokesman, and you'll be fine. And then we see Jonah. He called Jonah to go preach in Nineveh. And Jonah said, I don't want to preach in Nineveh. And he ran the other way and he got on the boat. He ended up in the ocean. He ended up being swallowed by a whale. And then he was later vomited up on the ground. And some people say that story is not true, that it's just an illustration or whatever. I'm here tonight to tell you it's true. It happened just the way the Bible says it happened. I believe it because the Bible says it. And God can create man out of the dust. And if he can take a rib out of a man and create a woman, and he can allow a man to be swallowed by a well and throw it up and, and live and survive for three days. Amen. Amen. And so Jonah ran. We see Joseph, with Jacob's youngest boy. It wouldn't seem that if you would call him to lead and to be a great leader and to become second in command in Egypt, but he did. David was also the youngest of a bunch of boys. He was a shepherd boy out in the field just taking care of sheep, a lowly job you might say, just a teenager. And yet God chose him to be the next king of Israel. Why did he choose David? The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. And that's why he chose him, because he knew his heart. And so physically, we wouldn't have chose him. He said that David had some older brothers, big, tall guys, good-looking young men. Surely he would choose them. But no, he chose the ruddiest of them all. See, God looks at a man's heart. And not his physical ability or his outward appearance. Amen. And so here's Gideon. I'm not qualified, God. I can't do this. You see, Gideon, when God talked to him, he was down in the wine press hiding from the Midianite soldiers. He was down there threshing of the wheat. And that's something that you do up on the hill where the wind blows, where to separate the, the wheat from the shaft. And, but he was down, the Bible says, in the wine press hiding because he was afraid of the Midianite army. He was scared. This guy, Gideon, was scared. And God called him and said, look, I need you to lead my people in this battle. I'm going to deliver y'all, and I need you, Gideon, to lead this battle. And Gideon says, I can't do it. And God says, look, I'm going to be with you. You can do it. You know, a lot of times God calls us to do things in our life. And if we're saved tonight, he's called us to do something, right? There's some the, the things he's called me to do that just flat out scare me to death. <laughs> the first one was back in the early 90s when he called me to be the youth pastor. And I thought, there's just no way. And we did it, we obeyed, and we had a great time with it. And it's, we've done it several times since then, right? But there's times that we'll be afraid. God will get you out of your comfort zone. There's times when you just have to trust him. And so Gideon said, Lord, I need a sign from you. I need something to let me know that you're going to sure enough be with me. And so he said, Lord, I'm going to put a blanket out tonight and the dew's going to fall. And in the morning, if the dew has fell on that blanket and the ground all around it is dry, then I'll know that you're going to bless. And so he goes out the next morning. The Bible says he took up that blanket or that fleece and he wrung it out, and he rang out a bowl full of water, the Bible says. And the ground around it was dry. And he said, wow, you know. And then he said, Lord, don't be mad at me now. God, don't get mad, but could you do that one more time? Just one more time, Lord. Uh, and so tonight, I'm going to put that same blanket back out. And in the morning, if the blanket is dry, and the ground has dew on it, then I'll know that your hand is going to be with me. God was very patient with Gideon, and that's exactly what he did. The next morning he went out, the blanket was dry, the ground was covered with dew, and his spirit rose, his confidence rose, and he said, okay, I can do this. Maybe I can do this. Maybe God is for real. Maybe he, he is going to bless us through this. And so we see here that God loves the unqualified. He loves to use people that we may not but choose. And tonight, I would ask this question. What battle are we fighting tonight? Do we sometimes feel unqualified to fight that battle? Do we feel undermanned? And I want you to remember tonight that the battle is the Lord's. You see, the battle is the Lord's battle. If we'll just let Him do that. Many of you may have heard of, I would dare say, probably in North Louisiana, probably all of you have heard of the 
the old movie, the book, Where the Red Fern Grows. Uh, one of my favorite old classics. I've read that book several times and watched the movie. And it's about a, a boy in Oklahoma, I believe, where it took place in the hills there. It wanted some coon dogs real bad. And uh, he, he's been trying to get, they were poor, they lived on a farm there, he didn't have any money, and, and he would walk into town, which is several miles away, to his grandpa's store, and he would be showing his grandpa pictures in the magazine of these coon dogs for sale, and man, he was just, he was wanting something so bad he could taste it. And, and uh, his grandpa would tell him, you know, just mind the work, save your money. And he said, Grandpa, I've been praying that God would help me get these coon dogs. And finally, his grandpa told him one day, he said, look, son, he said, you can pray all you want to. Sooner or later, you're going to have to do your part. You're going to have to start doing something. You're going to have to make some money. And if you'll start working, God will bless you. And he'll multiply that. So he did. He started doing odd jobs. And I remember one of them was going down to the creek and catching some minnows to sell to the men to, to, to fish with. And, and he just did anything and everything. And it took him a while to, to save this money. But once he began to work and began to save, God began to bless him too. And I think that's tr so true tonight that a lot of times we'll be praying about something and we'll be wanting something to happen so bad or we'll be praying for a lost person. Uh, and I think God's going to tell us, you need to do your part. You need to do something and then I'll bless your efforts for doing that. And that's the way it was in this story with, with Gideon. He just needed to be willing to obey God and then God will fight the battle. But we can't just sit down and say, God, take care of this or that. we got to do something. we got to be a proactive and we got to I'll be willing to do whatever God's called us to do. So here's Gideon. He doesn't feel qualified, but God says, you can do it. Number two, God loves not only the unqualified, but God loves an underdog. He loves an underdog. We use that term a lot in sports talk about the underdogs and, and all of that and, and who's the favorite. And we just had the Super Bowl and, and the underdog actually won, right? Uh, Kansas City was not favored to win. They won. Uh, when you think about in sports history, uh, there's a couple of, of great upsets that I remember, and I'm not a big hockey fan at all, but in 1980, some of y'all might remember, the U.S. hockey team uh, won the gold in the Olympics. It was uh, a crazy thing. The, the, uh, the U.S. team was made up of college players, just a guy from this college, a guy from over here, a guy, they just brought all these guys in, they never had played together, and they trained them for a few weeks and turned them loose. And then you had all these other nations that like uh, Finland and Canada has always been strong in, in hockey and, and the, the strongest of them all was Russia. And Russia, uh, they didn't bring a bunch of college boys in there to play. They brought their professional team, kind of like their all-star team, their dream team. And they, these guys had won the last four gold medals. They were almost unbeatable. They, they were just professional. That's their, that's their team sport in Russia is hockey. That's, the, that's their sport, not football. And so we know that you know, U.S., they, get, they kind of just caught fire at the right time and, and began playing together and working hard, and they find themselves playing against Russia, and they actually beat Russia. I mean, it would be, I don't know how you could uh, compare it, it would be something like West Monroe High School beating LSU in football or something. I mean, that's how big the gap was between these two teams. It was crazy. And I don't know if you remember or not, but Al Michaels was calling the game, and as the, the clock was running down, the U.S. had to leave, Al Michael said these famous words, do you believe in miracles? And it was, in fact, a miracle that day. One of the greatest upsets in sports history was when that team won the gold medal in hockey. God loves an underdog. Now, the question is, why does God love an underdog? I believe he loves an underdog because it shows his glory and his power when the victory is won. He likes to show his power. There are times that Jesus healed in the New Testament, or he might tell them, uh, don't tell anybody what I've just done to you. But then there was times that he healed, and he did it to show his power. And he would say, go and tell them that I healed you. Or, or whatever miracle he may have performed. You see, God wants his power to be displayed. He wants to get the glory. And so we see here in this story that the Israelites are a classic underdog. You see, the Israelites are 32,000 soldiers. 32,000. If you remember back in the text, the Bible says the Midianite soldiers were without number. In other words, there was too many to be counted. They were like grasshoppers. It was so many of them. And then so we see here that they were 
a huge underdog in this battle that was coming up. But then a strange thing happens, and God goes to Gideon, and he says, look, we have too many soldiers. And can you imagine the thought that went through Gideon's mind? Like, Lord, what are you talking about? We have too many. I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of them, and we have 32,000. We don't have too many. And God said, yeah, we got too many. There's 32,000 of y'all go out there and happen to win, and y'all going to be patting y'all stuff on the back, thinking y'all did it, beating your chest. And he said, y'all won't give me the glory. Y'all won't give me credit for it. He said, we're going to cut it back. He said, get in, gather all your soldiers together and tell them, if you are afraid to go fight in this battle, just go back home. And you know what happened? Out of 32,000 men, 22,000 chose to go home. 22,000 said, it's not worth fighting for. We've seen God's miracles before. We know he parted the sea and led the folks across on dry ground. We know that he led us by a cloud during the day and by fire at night. We know that he rained down manna from heaven to feed us, but yet we don't trust him in this battle. There's just too many of them. We're not willing to go fight. We're going to sift this one out because we're scared. That's about 70% of the army was gone. And I'll dare say this tonight because I'm not on the payroll, but that's about the way the church is tonight. About 70% choose to sit out and not do anything, never help anybody or pray or be concerned whatsoever about anything in the church, griping about what the other 30% are doing and how they're doing. And that's just about the right number I can figure. And so we see here the army has been cut down to 10,000 soldiers. And God comes back to Gideon and he said, listen up. We still got too many soldiers, Gideon. And Gideon's like, God, are you kidding? I mean, we're down to 10,000. 22,000 just left me. And God said, we got too many. We need to narrow it down some. We need to make it a fair fight. He said, send, send the 10,000 down to the river. And those that bend over to drink water and lap it like a dog, keep them. The ones that get down on their hands and knees and put their weapon in the water, kick them out. 300 men bent down and wrapped the water like a dove. And so Gideon, his army had been chosen, 300 men. And he came back, and God told him, these are the men I want you to have. And y'all are going to go in battle against this great army. And I'm going to be with you, and I'm going to turn them over to you. In boxing, there's a, a thing they do before the fight. It's called the tail of the tape. And they give the guys measurements. He's six foot three and 240, and his arm span is what, however many inches, and his record is such and such, and all of this, and where he's from, and he's wearing blue trunks tonight, whatever. All right? The other guy's six foot nine, or whatever. And they go to, that's called the tail of the tape. And so the tail of the tape for this fight is Israel has Gideon and 300 versus an army that is without number. Huge underdog. And so we know tonight that God loves the unqualified and He loves an underdog. In 2016, Donald Trump was an underdog. All the polls had crooked Hillary up by 10 points or more. Right? And uh, I'm sorry, you're a Hillary fan. <laughs> Heard it so much in framework. <laughs> but all the polls had to lead to big. And we just, everybody just kind of knew it was going to probably win. And I'll never forget that night. God had a different plan. Even though he was an underdog, and I don't know if Donald Trump was saved tonight, but as Brother Ruben said, he, he sure has a potty mouth sometimes. <laughs> but God's using him. I don't you know. We can't deny that. Yeah. He's using him to do a lot of good stuff for the church and for Christianity and all these judges and things. It, it has an impact over the years. It's going to have an impact on America. And I hope that he gets reelected, if I can say that, without being fired. <laughs> God loves an underdog. The third and last thing that God loves in this story is that God loves unity. And this brings us to the battle. The judges 7. <clears throat> 16 and 17. The 
It says, and he divided the 300 men into three companies. And he put a trumpet in every man's hand with the empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. And he said unto them, look on me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall you do. And I'll just tell you the rest of what happened. So they have these torches, they have these glass lamps. And he sent a hundred men this way, he sent a hundred men that way, and he was in the middle group of the hundred men, and they eased up and got around the Midianite army. And he told them, he said, whenever I do, whatever I do, you do it. And so he broke the glass picture. And so they all broke theirs. So they raised their torches, torches and they began to shout. And when they did, the Midianite army, all these men, hundreds of thousands of men, looked and saw all these torches, all 301 of them, <laughs> and it scared them. And they heard the cry. And the Bible says that they began to flee from the Israelites. And when you begin to flee, you're in trouble. And they overtook them. And they defeated the Midianites there that night. God's hand was upon them. And later on, there's a verse there that says that over 120,000 soldiers fell that night. Think about that. That's about, that's, for 300 men, that's, that's about 400 apiece to take in. That's a lot of fight. But God was on their side. This army, these 300 men, were unified. You see, when they started with 32,000, God knew the hearts of these soldiers. And he says, I need these 300. I got 300 in there, and I'm going to get them somehow or another. I'm going to narrow it down to these guys that will fight for me. And they were unified. They were a team. They had, as the church in Acts, they had all things in common. And Antioch, I'm going to tell you tonight, if we'll get all things in common, if we'll get unified and have unity in the church, we haven't seen anything yet. Amen. God can look through here, and we can continue this revival like we've never seen before. It's all about being unified, pulling in the same direction, having the same goal. Not about us at all, but about Him. Amen. Amen. If we can get to that point in our life, and in our church, I mean, there's no telling what Antioch can do. Amen. And we have just touched the hymn so far, I believe, in what he can do. And so tonight, we need that same unity that these soldiers have. It says in chapter 8, verse 28, Thus was Midian subdued before the children of Israel, so that they lifted up their heads no more. And the country was in quietness forty years in the days of Gideon. In 1 Samuel, we see the story of David. And he goes out, we know the story, he goes down into the valley to fight Goliath. And Goliath's ridiculing him, making fun of him. And David just kind of stops. You have to see this picture. There's Goliath, and his army's behind him. And here's David, and the Israelites are on the side of the mountain on his side. And everybody's listening. David gets their attention. He says, I'm going to tell you something, big boy. God's going to deliver you into my hand today. Because you see, Goliath, the battle is the Lord's battle. The battle is the Lord's. So tonight, I would ask you again, what battle are you fighting tonight? What mountain are you looking at? What seems impossible for you to conquer tonight? You see, the battle is the Lord's. He'll be with you. But you've got to be willing to fight. You've got to be willing to be obedient to Him and do what He asks you to do. I'm going to ask you to stand tonight. I'm going to ask for the Lord's command to come. You've got something on your heart and you're obedient to the Lord. You come, I'll pray with you, or you come to the altar and pray. Whatever your need is.